today's main business, Lecture 8. Today we'll finish talking about analog modulation. Today is our last time to talk about analog modulation. From next week we'll be talking about digital. Now you might think analog and digital are so different. Why are we wasting time talking about analog? Well, everything is digital. In many ways, everything that's digital is also analog. Okay, and you'll, you'll, this will become clearer from next week. So two important things. Number one, analog modulation is what we use for digital modulation. It's the same. Amplitude, frequency, phase. There's nothing else we can change. The second important thing is that there's no such thing as digital communication. All communication is analog. All we have is digital information. But we never have digital wireless communication. Wireless communication is always analog. So the information coming in and leaving your phone is analog. Or let's say the signal is analog, even if the information it contains is digital. So everything we've covered in the past seven weeks is very relevant. Okay? It's relevant to digital comms. And if you're doing digital comms next semester, or next year, sorry, it'll be very, very relevant. So today we're going to talk about the demodulation of FM. And even though that's the title of the lecture, there's only three slides about demodulation. Most of the time, we'll be talking about the bandwidth of FM. So last week, we introduced the idea of instantaneous frequency and instantaneous phase. We spoke about depth of modulation or modulation index. And today we're going to use that modulation index to estimate the bandwidth of FM. Then we'll talk about how is FM demodulated. Okay, so there's only two or three things really we need to cover today. Most of the rest is just a little bit of mathematics around that. A couple of questions for you to do that we'll cover We'll go through the solutions in the problem class, not today, and a couple of videos. So that's a summary of today's lecture. It's actually, even though there's not much information, it's a really good summary. That's all we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how we estimate the bandwidth for FM. We can't calculate it, but we can estimate it. We're going to break FM down into two categories, wideband and narrowband FM. We're going, then going to talk very quickly about how to demodulate FM, how to recover the message. And next week, we're going to talk about digitization. Why next week? Because there's no class on Thursday. There's no class this Thursday. What there is, is a, pro, a, a class test tomorrow. Okay. If that's news to you, if you've just suddenly turned up after not having turned up for three or four weeks, there's a class test tomorrow. It's the first of two class tests. It's not optional. There's no reset. But it's a chance for you to get 15%. Okay? Fairly easy to get full mark. Okay? I said this before. I'll say it again. It's 15 questions in one hour. The first few questions are really easy. They're easier than the Cahoots question. You can just bang through them. Bang, 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 bang. The questions after that might take a few minutes. Okay? So come prepared. Don't come prepared to spend 20 minutes flicking through your notes and scrolling through problem sheets. Come prepared to answer the questions. Now, there is a practice test. Some of you have tried that practice test, but not not enough. Okay? As it happens, so the practice test has been up for a week, but less than 70 people have actually tried the questions. Okay? So lots of people got full mark, and that's good. Most of those people had to do the test two or three times to get the full mark, but 69 is still too low. Okay? I, 
I was expecting most of you to have tried the problem class. Now, given that the class test is just 26 hours from now, then that's not a lot of time. Okay? Now, most people didn't do too well on the practice test first time. They had to do it a second time. And the reason is, even if you think you know the answer, you might not be entering the answer in the way it's being asked, or you might have misunderstood the question, or you might have misunderstood the material. The best way to find out is to take the test, make a mistake, and then read the feedback and fix the mistake. Because we don't want you to make that mistake in the class test tomorrow. Yes? Sorry? Why would it be the same questions? Yeah. No, there, there is overlap. Yes, yes, there is overlap. And if they're not the same, they will be similar. They will be similar in style, similar in format, similar in difficulty. Okay, there will be overlap. So everyone is guaranteed to see at least one question from the, uh, from the practice questions. But if you haven't tried it, you won't know. Now, what bothered me is a large number, not just 11, much more than that. A large number of you didn't attempt the test. You just submitted nothing. So you went through a, a dry run, a practice test, without submitting any answers, scoring a zero. Why would you do that? So you could read the feedback, learn a little more, and then try the test. But that's not practice. That doesn't help. Even if you think it helps, that, that is not a good strategy. Okay? Don't just try the test to have a look at the questions and say, hmm, yeah, I can do that. Oh, that's, that's difficult. I'll read that later. Let me see the answer to that. That's not the idea. If you want to do that, you can use the problem sheets. You can use the examples from the PowerPoints. You can even use the Kahoot if you wanted to. But the idea for the practice test is to test yourself to see how you're going to do. Then read the feedback and retest yourself. It's, half, it's only um, 10 questions, so you can do it a couple of times in an hour. You can build yourself up to 100%. Okay, so use the remaining 26 hours. Take that test. Keep taking that test until you're good at it. Any questions about tomorrow? Lectures 1 to 6 are included. Okay, so everything up to and including demodulation of DSP. So FM isn't included. Lectures 1 to 6 are included. Any other questions? Now, lots of people, quite a few, of these, people who actually took the test, have asked me about the time constant question. So there's a question that 69 of you will be familiar with where there's a time constant. So there's a, an envelope detector and we need to choose com uh, values for R and C. I think C is given in the question and the question says choose a suitable value for R. Okay. How do we choose the time constant? We said that the time constant is between the reciprocals of the carrier frequency and the modulating frequency. Now, you know that. That's not new. The questions were all about this. People somehow thought that... That's what it looked like, greater than or equal, less than or equal. And they thought, oh, it's okay to choose a value of RC up to and including 1 over FM, or up to very close to 1 over FM. It's not less than or equal. It's not even less than and greater than. It's much less than and much bigger than. Okay? So if you've got, if you've got 1 and 100 then 2 isn't acceptable. 2 is bigger than 1, but it's not much bigger than 1. 90 
is too close to 100. It needs to be very far away from both. Okay, so somewhere in the middle. Okay, so you'd want something as far away as possible to both of those. Okay. It doesn't really matter what the value is, as long as it's sort of close to the middle. Okay, so several people. When I say several, it's nine or ten people have asked that question. Out of 69. So we're talking about almost 15% of you. So that's important. Will there be a question about this in the class test? Absolutely. Yes, there will be, because there was a lecture about it. Okay? So... That's for the class test. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for everybody to do well. I don't want anybody failing the class test. Okay? That doesn't mean I want everyone to get full mark, but I want everyone to do well, and you have every opportunity. Okay? I'm giving you the practice test to allow you to prepare. Any other questions before we start about the test? Do you all know where you're going to be? If you're allowed extra time, if you're allowed extra time, then your test will be in the Triple E building, in room 402 or 406, whatever it says on your timetable. Okay? So I will have emailed you about that. If you think you, you deserve extra time and you haven't been emailed by me or you don't have 402 or 406 in your timetable, Get in touch, urgently. Okay, so let's make a start. This is familiar to you. Here, our message is encoded within the angle, within the phase of the sine wave, not the amplitude. So for FM, we take the angle and we integrate it. Why do we say we integrate it? Because the frequency is the derivative of the phase. And for FM, it's a function of the message. So for PM, we don't integrate it. We just... Okay, so here, phase is the integral of frequency and vice versa. Frequency is the derivative of phase. Very important. That was, as I said, the, the, the most important message from last week's lecture. Today we're going to talk about how much bandwidth we need. And I keep saying I'm going to estimate the bandwidth because it's not possible to calculate the bandwidth. So for AM, for DSB, VSB, SSB, we could calculate the bandwidth very accurately because it was either FM or 2 FM or 1 point something FM for VSB. But for frequency modulation, we can't do that because the bandwidth is actually infinite. What we can do is we can estimate the effective bandwidth. So this is the modulation index, beta. This is what we will be using to estimate our bandwidth. So the beta is the ratio between the maximum frequency deviation, that's, the, that's how far the frequency has drifted from the carrier frequency, divided by the baseband bandwidth, the message bandwidth. So delta F over FM. Okay? This is our guy, John Carson. He estimated this 98% effective bandwidth. So you've heard the word before in ELECT 270. This is where it came from. The actual bandwidth of FM is infinite, but it just happens that 98% of the power or the energy is contained within some bandwidth which we call the effective bandwidth. So it's the effective bandwidth which we will use as a proxy for bandwidth. So when we say FM bandwidth, what we mean is the effective bandwidth. So in an exam, if it says calculate the bandwidth of this FM signal, don't be cheeky and say, oh, it's, in, it's infinity. What we mean is the effective bandwidth, but I'll never say effective bandwidth. You need to know that. Okay, so the effective bandwidth of FM is related to two things. It's related to beta, your modulation index, and it's related to FM, your baseband bandwidth. 
And beta itself is related to fm, because it's delta f divided by fm. But to keep it simple, this is the expression. So it's more than twice fm. What's the bandwidth for am? AM is double side band, remember? So the bandwidth for AM is twice FM. What's the bandwidth for DSB? Same, twice FM. What's the bandwidth for SSB, single side band? It's just FM. What's the bandwidth for FM? It's twice FM times beta plus one. Okay? Now this, this is an approximation that holds if beta is big, if beta is bigger than 1. Otherwise, we have something else. We'll talk about that in a second. So, we have narrow band and wide band FM. So if beta is 1, 2, 5, 6, 20, if it's that kind of number, that's how you calculate the bandwidth. You add 1 to beta, multiply by 2, multiply by the baseband bandwidth. If beta is small, if we're talking about a fraction, if it's 0 0.2, it's 0 0.6, it's 0 0.1, if we have a small value for beta, we don't add 1. We simply multiply 2 times fm. So the bandwidth of fm can be as narrow, as low, as small as twice FM, which is double sideband, or it can be as wide as twice FM times 1 plus beta. It can't be less than twice FM. Okay, so which has a bigger bandwidth, FM or AM? It's FM all the time. It can be the same for narrowband FM, but FM can never have less bandwidth than AM, except in one case. And that's if we don't have both sidebands for AM. So if we have SSB or VSB, then yes, FM will have a greater bandwidth. Sorry, FM will have a greater bandwidth. If, actually, forget what I just said. FM will always have a greater bandwidth, except if we have narrowband FM, in which case it will have the same bandwidth. Now, if AM has only one sideband, or VSB, then automatically it will have a lower bandwidth than FM. So FM will never have a lower bandwidth than AM, ever. Okay, so that's the first important thing we needed to cover today, which was Carson's rule, bandwidth approximation, narrow band and wide band FM. So this is what the spectrum might look like. So for narrow band FM, for a very small value of beta, your effective bandwidth would be approximately twice FM. The actual bandwidth would be greater, but the effective bandwidth would be twice FM. That's why we say the bandwidth is always bigger than the bandwidth of AM, even if it's narrow band. Because even though the effective bandwidth is the same, the actual bandwidth will be greater. And for wide band FM with a bigger value of uh, beta, again, your spectrum is not going to resemble the spectrum of your message. It's not like AM, where you take your message spectrum and then you just shift it up, shift it down. Now for FM, the spectrum has a completely different shape, and the effective bandwidth is what we're calculating. So it's the, uh, the, the distance on the frequency axis between this peak and that peak. But this is just an illustrative example. You don't need to be able to plot this or to use it in any way. Okay, so these are the relationships after substituting all the values for beta. This is what we have. So if we have some message, which to be consistent with our AM examples, we're using a simple single tone message. So cosine. AM cosine 2 pi FM. So that's our message. 
the instantaneous frequency is equal to the carrier frequency plus something that's proportional to that message. So the constant of proportionality is this scalar KF, modulation sensitivity, and this is our message here. So if you multiply these two together, that gives you your maximum frequency deviation. So that's how far the frequency can deviate from the carrier, because the cosine at maximum can be 1, minimum minus 1. So the maximum deviation is delta F. Now the phase is the integral of the frequency. So the instantaneous phase is the integral of the instantaneous frequency. What's the, ins what's the integral of a cosine? It's a sine. Where did the FM come from? Well, we're differentiating. So we're integrating. And the ratio of the two, delta F over FM, gives you your modulation index beta. All this results in this expression, which you can then use as a template, as the format for a general FM signal. So when you see a signal that looks anything like that, the coefficient of the sine or the cosine is your modulation index beta. So again, same expressions again. Keep summarizing it. The general expression for FM is some amplitude, doesn't matter what that is, times cosine or sine, a, carri a, a carrier term, 2 pi FC or omega CT, plus the integral of our message. For PM, we don't integrate. We simply multiply. If our modulation index is big, we can estimate the bandwidth using Carson's rule. It's Carson, not Carlson, so ignore that L there. If beta is small, it's simply twice the baseband bandwidth, similar to DSB. This is an interesting comment here. Think about that and think about why that's the case. We'll discuss this in the problem class. Why does doubling the signal amplitude double the FM or PM bandwidth. Okay, So if you double the amplitude of your signal, that will require twice as much bandwidth. Okay, so narrow band FM, that's where beta is much less than 1, small value of beta. How is that different from DSB? Well, remember the, the spectrum we just looked at? There's a carrier term. So it's similar to DSB with a carrier, DSB FC or DSB LC or simply AM. They both contain a carrier term. They both contain an upper side band and a lower side band. They both have a bandwidth of approximately 2 FM. The difference is that the side bands for narrow band FM are out of phase. Don't worry about proving that. It's not important to know why or how. What's important is that the amplitude of FM is constant and the amplitude of AM changes, whereas the frequency of AM is constant and the frequency of FM changes. And that has implications. Remember when we spoke about the quality of FM and the noise immunity of FM? Remember when I brought in that radio, that big stereo? I tuned into an AM radio station and an FM radio station and you heard the difference in quality between the two. That's because the amplitude of an FM signal is constant. And even if it varies because of noise, it doesn't affect the demodulation. We're about to talk about demodulation. Okay. A couple of questions. We're not going to go through the answers. You can, you can have a quick attempt at it. So, up there, that just tells you where I got the example from. So I copied this from the, uh, the textbook, one of the recommended textbooks, Stremler. And that's your FM signal. Compare that signal to the format I showed you here, the format at the bottom. 
So you have your carrier component and you have your message. So just equating these, you can see automatically that beta is equal to 10. So we can find the modulation index without doing much work. So the modulation index is 8. What's the carrier frequency? Where would you look for the carrier frequency? You should be looking right here for FC. So you should be looking here for the frequency. So it's 10 to the power 6 times pi. That's the carrier frequency, but it's in radians per second. We generally want these answers in hertz. So if, you, if, we're not, if you're not told otherwise, assume the answer should be in hertz, in cycles per second. So it's 10 to the power 6, a million pi, divided by 2 pi. So a million pi divided by 2 pi is 500,000, so it's 500 kilohertz. That's your, that's your carrier frequency. What's the modulation index? It's 8. You don't need to do much work to find that. What's the peak frequency deviation? The peak frequency deviation, that's delta F. How would you find that? Several ways of doing it. But an easy way is to say, well, beta, which is 8, is delta F over FM. Do we know the message frequency? message frequency is up there somewhere. It's hiding inside this, the argument for the sign. So it's 1,000 pi divided by 2 pi. So it's 500 hertz. That that is your message frequency. So FM is 1,000 pi divided by 2 pi. That's your FM. Beta is 8, and beta happens to be delta F divided by FM. So if you simply rearrange that, you can find delta F equals 8 times 500, there you go, 4,000, 4 kilohertz. So that's your peak frequency deviation, delta F. Units? Hertz, in this case kilohertz. Okay, so fairly straightforward. Similar kind of question. This time I haven't given you the expression, but I've told you what the frequency deviation is. It's 50 kilohertz. So delta F is given. And the question is, well, that's a carrier frequency. The question is, what's the approximate bandwidth? How would you find approximate bandwidth? So bandwidth, we'd use Carson's rule. Remember? So to estimate bandwidth, you'd use 2 times 1 plus beta times fm. That's if we have a big value for beta. If beta happens to be small, you just say 2 times fm. So for each of these, you'd simply find beta, which is 50 kilohertz divided by 500, 50 kilohertz divided by 500, 50 kilohertz divided by 10,000. So you find beta. If beta is small, the bandwidth is simply double that value, double the, beta, the uh, baseband message bandwidth. If beta is big, it's 2 times 1 plus beta times fm. Okay? These are the estimates for the bandwidth. Okay, so you can you could do that and there'll be more examples in the problem class. And yet more examples here. Okay, before we start talking about demodulation, I just wanted to um, cover a few things quickly. So, last week we spoke about FM receiver chips inside your mobile phones. Here I just wanted to share with you this video I came across. So in, in the United States, in hurricane season, they prepare themselves with these hurricane kits, 
which always include an FM radio. Okay, you're not going to rush to eBay to buy one of those, but it's useful to know that this is very relevant to many people living in many parts of the world. Part of preparation for hurricane season involves buying a particular kind of radio. Listen to this. The earthquake in Nepal in 2015. Okay, so that's something to think about while we talk about demodulation. If I can get this. Okay, so the different types of FM demodulator. We're going to look at two of the simplest um, of the two. There are others. There's the uh, phase lock loop style modulator that we won't be covering. We'll be looking at something called a slope detector or a discriminator and the zero crossing detector. Okay, so look at that signal there. Look at the, um, the expression there in the box. 
That's our FM signal. Where's the message? The message is hidden inside that integration. So in order to recover the message, you need the instantaneous frequency. And the instantaneous frequency is the derivative of the phase. Okay? That doesn't make sense. Keep saying it to yourself. The frequency is the derivative of the phase. So omega or f is d by dt of phi. The instantaneous frequency is the derivative of the phase. And the information in FM is encoded in the frequency. So we want to extract that frequency. We can't look at the envelope because the amplitude is constant. We want to somehow get the information from the frequency. How do you extract the frequency of a sine wave? It's not as simple as finding the envelope or multiplying by a local oscillator. So mathematically, what you'd need to do is take the derivative. So what we do, as a block diagram at least, is we take the derivative. We use a differentiator. So it's also called a slope detector because a slope is the first derivative. So we take the derivative of our constant amplitude cosine. When you take the derivative, you end up modulating your cosine. You end up multiplying by the derivative here. So your amplitude actually starts to vary. The frequency also varies. So this is actually an interesting signal. This red signal is both AM and FM. Because the amplitude contains information and the frequency contains information. But now we can use an envelope detector. Now we can use the good old diode, resistor, and capacitor, and recover this just as we would normal AM, because we're not interested in the frequency. We're interested in the amplitude, or the envelope. So we'd use an envelope detector. So a differentiator plus an envelope detector gives us our original message signal. So it says AM signal. It's not exactly AM. It's AM between inverted commas because the frequency also changes. But because the amplitude is modulated and the amplitude does contain the message, we call it AM. Okay, that's just another expression of the same thing. The other demodulator, we've almost finished the lecture, not more to go, is called a zero crossing detector. That's just another way of saying that we want to find the frequency, but instead of differentiating, we want to look at how close these zero crossings are. So every time the sine wave equals zero, there's a zero crossing. So when those zeros are bunched together, it means that the frequency is high. And when those zeros are spread apart, it means the amplitude or the frequency must have been low. And therefore, the amplitude of the message must have been low. So what we try to do is to count these zeros. To do that, we first limit the amplitude to eliminate any variation. Then we differentiate, then we rectify, then we generate pulses, then we integrate those pulses using a low-pass filter. That gives us another version of our message signal. Okay? So we don't need to go into this in much detail. You just need to know the sequence of these blocks in our demodulator. Finally, a couple of quick things to share with you about the future of FM. Okay? So we spoke last week about the chips in your phones, and I said, why do you think the chips have been disabled in the recent um, iPhones? And many of you said, well, because the Internet is the future, and digital is the future. Well, digital and Internet are two separate things, because there's digital radio, which has nothing to do with the Internet, and there's Internet radio. So there's all the streaming that you get through Spotify and Apple Music. But there's also DAB, digital radio, which you can get from most radios now. But both of those are not FM radio. Okay, so the kind of thing I'm sharing here, it's not for the exam, it's not for the class test, it's for your general information, but these are the kind of things you would be expected to know. Okay? 
at a job interview. If you're joining the workforce anywhere, people will expect an electrical engineer to have some knowledge of this. So Norway has shut down their FM stations, all digital now. So that was in Norway. In the UK, we still haven't made the switch. They've been talking about it since 2011. They were supposed to do it in 2015, then again in 2018. They still haven't done it. So those are three three good reasons. I'll repeat that. Okay, so the UK will make the switch, but we haven't made an announcement yet. Okay, many people will be affected. My car, for example, that's where I listen to radio. It doesn't have DAB, so I'm reliant on FM. So if FM is suddenly turned off, then millions of drivers like me will be without radio. Okay, so that's something to at least be aware of. Okay, so where are we? That's what we spoke about today. We said there's two types of FM, narrow band and wide band. The difference between the two is simply in the bandwidth requirement. The bandwidth requirement is an estimation for which we use something called Carson's rule. Narrow band FM is where beta, the modulation index, is much less than one. Wide band FM is for everything else. There are two types of Demodulator we use for FM. We don't need to go into the electronics of the two. We simply need to know how they work. Okay? There are, there's more than two, but we, we chose two to mention in this lecture. Next week, we'll talk about digitization so that for the rest of the semester, we can talk about digital comms. There won't be a lecture on Thursday, but there will be a class test tomorrow. I'm not taking attendance tomorrow, so um, once you finish your test, you can just log off and leave. Okay, you should get your score and feedback to the test after the test. So you'll get your score immediately. You can get feedback, I think it's um, around 3 o'clock. So around 3, three o'clock, when everybody's finished taking the test, including the people who have extra time, then you can get feedback. Yes?
Does everybody have five different locations? What are they? Could everybody please check their timetable? Let me know if you have five different locations. Okay, how many of you have 128 Mount Pleasant? Only. How many of you have 128 Mount Pleasant only? How many of you have 128 Mount Pleasant only? Nothing else. So you guys go to 128 Mount Pleasant. I will, I will attempt to get this fixed. That's why I asked you a couple of weeks ago to, to check this for me. I will attempt to get this fixed. If it isn't fixed at 1 o'clock tomorrow, everybody go to the CTH. Okay, the blue, green, red, orange, etc. It's all one big room. If you can't find a place there because you didn't arrive in time, then I'll send you off to 128 Mount Pleasant. Yes? That's a bit silly. I, 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 will, I will try to get it fixed for you. In any case, don't panic. The venues are as follows. If you have extra time, and there's only three of you who have extra time, then the venue is fourth floor E, 402 or 406, whichever one I emailed you with. Everyone else, it's the CTH, the orange, blue, red, green room, where we used to take the tests last year. And there's another room, 128 Mount Pleasant, PC, room one. Okay? You can go to either, but you're more likely to find a place if you go to the CTH. So, if this is fixed by tomorrow, and you have one room to go to, go to that room. If it isn't fixed, go to the CTH. If it's full, walk across campus to 128 Mount Pleasant. Okay? Any other questions about tomorrow? Okay, excellent. Good luck, everyone, with the practice test and with the test. I'll see you in the test, and then I'll see you next Monday.